Okay, well, we're delighted to have Dr. Armin Schwarzbach as our guest this evening. He um, is a, a doctor as well as a PhD and um, has many other qualifications as well, and has specialized in laboratory medicine and the diagnosis and treatment of patients with tick-borne diseases for close to three decades now. Um, he studied biochemistry, pharmacology, and medicine in Germany and worked in hospitals uh, for many years before um, deciding to uh, specialize in laboratory medicine and uh, was the co-founder and CEO of um, a large borreliosis clinic in Germany before setting up his own laboratory called Armin Labs in Augsburg, Germany, where he's currently the CEO and that is dedicated to the diagnosis of tick-borne diseases. He holds many different positions. Um, he's a board member of ILADS, which is the International um, Society for Lyme and um, Associated Diseases, and um, the German Borreliosis Society, the Swiss Association for Tick-Borne Diseases. He's, of course, a, a, um, a board member of the Academy of Nutritional Medicine as well, and um, advises countries all over the world in this field. So without any further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Armin Schwarzbach. Thank you. Over to you, Armin. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, this is Stephen Krauser. Um, um, I wish you a pleasant evening from Germany here. It's uh, dark and cold in Bavaria. We have snowy time a little. I hope the weather is getting better, but you know, snowy weather is not so good for the ticks. And, but I'm sure in Bavaria we will have a um, large tick population this year again. Um, today, tonight, I want to talk about identifying uh, stealth infections that may underlie ME, FM, and other syndromes. Um, I will give you some tips on test selection, and afterwards we have enough time um, for question and answers. And additionally, I'm now on the board of the German Borreliosis Society. We will have in two weeks meeting. So um, politically, we hope we can come forward in the field of Lyme disease and co-infections. The agenda for today is a general overview. We will talk about the difficulties of using antibody assays for testing Lyme disease and co-infections. We will talk about the advantages and maybe some disadvantages of the Gilly spot. It's in the from gamma release essay. The word from the site transformation test, um, the differences between, we will talk about the CD7 cells, can it be useful, helpful or not. We will talk about selection, test selection, most relevant test, and I will show you also example for bacterial and, uh, for me, very important viral infections that may underlie unexplained conditions, uh, for example, FM, ME, dementia, Alzheimer's, or OCD, and Tourette's. Um, in, in England, um, the NHS Lyme testing belongs still to the rare and imported pathogens laboratory. I think the word rare is not so correct to use that and imported also not because you have a tick surely carrying Borreliabopdorfi and maybe some other co-infections uh, in the tick, so um, it should be changed the name in the future. The official testing in the United Kingdom nowadays has a two-child uh, serodiagnostic algorithm. You do an ELISA, and if the ELISA is positive or equivocal, then you are allowed to do an IgG, IgM Western blot, also called immunoblot. Um, Western blot is uh, similar to, or is one part of the immunoblots. We have southern blots, eastern blots, uh, western blots we are doing in the western world. This is a, a variation of the immunoblot. Um, you also can do in NHS system C6 ELISA and you can do IgG IgM line plots, which is a kind of immunoblot of Western blot, and um, PCR testing is also introduced. On the right side, you see IgG IgM bands by uh, against antibodies. You see this is really a standardized technique. Um, on the other hand, these um, blots uh, have restrictions. Um, the bands are not so equivocal in the uh, in the band itself, in the structure of a Western blot. We can discuss later that point. 
However, the antibody assays have um, a problem in chronic Lyme. I'm just talking about chronic Lyme, not about stage one and two, which means a bull's arrest or um, a bell's palsy. Uh, we are just talking about a stage three, uh, a chronic infection. Um, the sensitivity is a problem of the ELISA test in chronic Lyme disease. Um, I did an internal study some years ago with different test producers. Um, they are certified and they are IVD registered, and we have seen around a variation of 32 up to 42 percent sensitivity in this patient. So that uh, that's a huge problem of misdiagnosing by those positive ELISA tests. The specificity, which means uh, the correct positive uh, ratio, is a very high one in the Western blots. Uh, but in the Western blots, we have also restricted sensitivity up to 60%. That means if you find Borrelia antibodies in the Western blot, um, these are with a high specificity um, antibodies against Borrelia burgdorferi, but if you don't find them, you cannot exclude antibodies. Uh, many factors um, can be responsible for false negative, for a weak or a bad sensitivity. This is an extract you can go through yourself for some reasons. We have more reasons for that. Um, as an example, uh, we have spirochates in L forms uh, with no cell walls, or we name them now ground bodies, pleomorphic forms, which makes it impossible for the body to produce antibodies against the whole spirochete. Therefore, a new development came up the last two years uh, by a, a university in Finland. It's named the TICLEX Basic. Uh, TICLEX Basic is the first test worldwide um, testing or checking against Borrelia antibodies, IgG, IgM, against this um, round body forms. And also, if you have maybe antibiotic treatment, it can be false negative or just another example. Um, the lab tests, um, they are not, should not be used. Uh, we use them nevertheless um, for routine uh, laboratories, but normally they were developed all for scientific purpose, investigational purpose, and not for use in routine, routine laboratories. Um, I put all this data a little together. There's a lot of more paperwork about false positivity um, uh, in the specificity and the sensitivity of false negativity of the body antibody tests. And but you see, the specificity is a really good one. We have um, over uh, around 99%. But the sensitivity, what does that mean? Also, Borrelia antibodies need not to be 100% uh, specific. Um, we know now that uh, a study came up by um, uh, CDC in America, which uh, showed around 50% um, specificity of IgM Western blots, IgM antibodies. I think personally this is a uh, to, to a high percentage, but it can be that some viruses like EBV, CMV, parvovirus B19, uh, Coxsackie, Echovirus, other viruses are able um, to let your body produce a false positive IgM antibodies. This is known. Um, the sensitivity is our big challenge in the future. We have around 40% as an average. Um, this is not sufficient for us, and we are not so happy about the sensitivity of the um, conventional Western plots. There's a lot of paperwork about that. You can go through all these papers. They are not respected in the guidelines. This is a big problem. Um, we don't understand why it is, but normally this paperwork should be respected and we should document more false seronegativity also in evidence-based paperwork, but this is not in the guidelines. Um, again, page 10, so you have a lot of paperwork about that, a lot of scientific work that it can exist, the false seronegative result. But you know, the doctors, um, the GPs, they believe in ELISA, they believe in the Western blots, and they say, I can exclude a chronic Lyme by a negative ELISA. And this is completely wrong point of view. Then you, you never understood what laboratory tests uh, can mean for a patient. Um, to mention also, you cannot exclude HRV infections by negative ELISA. We have also a very problem with some few cases with sensitivity. So in the past, I have uh, checked more for the T-cell testings, and um, this is named as an example the ILISPORT. Um, the lymphocyte transformation test, it's not the absolute correct uh, word or 
method uh, word, wording for that. LTT, it's mixed up with Illisport. LTT is our own category of testings. The Illisport is documenting the interferon gamma reads. And this is a functional test. So um, T cells are stimulated for um, giving you an information about the T cellular immune reaction. Uh, don't forget, in this context, uh, Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis by the symptoms of a patient, and it's not a laboratory test diagnosis. This is uh, very often mixed up that uh, patients tell, or doctors ask me, I have antibodies, now I have Lyme disease. I say, no, you don't have Lyme disease, and this is a clinical diagnosis. You have antibodies against, or T-cellular immune reactions against Borrelia But if a test is positive for that, uh, you can say these test results support the clinical suspicion for uh, Lyme disease. And then you have a higher chance to get a diagnosis by that. And doctors always work that principle. So um, I don't understand why this should be a problem uh, to discuss a test system proving Lyme disease. It's completely nonsense. Um, the Illispot um, was named as a game changer for uh, Lyme disease. For the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis, because it supports the clinical suspicion. And in a book you can find, it was done by Lehman and others in 2012, they said sensitivity is estimated around 84%, specificity around 94%. We have a new study by a professor in Ireland, he um, documented the same data. Uh, interestingly, um, some years ago it was presented at um, Boston IELTS conference, the paper is not published yet. But we have similar data, sensitivity is around 84%. What does that mean? You never will find 100% of the patients clinically suffering from Lyme disease. Not all of them have positive Illisport results. And, and uh, also you can have some unspecific reactions with maybe viruses. Uh, so um, this can be in the Western blot, but also in the Illisport tests. So um, we have around 94% specificity and 84%. And now you say, oh, that's not no good data, but uh, every percentage over 80%, 90% is a wonderful result in laboratory medicine. As an example, if you have a suspicion for a kidney insufficiency, you just find in 50% of the patients, around 50%, you find elevated creatinine. So the sensitivity of very established clinical chemical marker, creatinine is just 50%. So what? Um, the Illisport LTT, maybe we say again, lymphocyte transformation test, it's different from interferon gamma release assay. The LTT is um, a little misunderstanding of that method. Um, LTT means a proliferation of uh, lymphocytic reactions. It's a proliferation test. Normally, you should say uh, LPT, but the LTT means originally a transformation. If you check for the word transformation, it's a transformation. This means in the form gamma rays. So this means uh, our cytokine release. This means is a little irritating. Um, it's better to use not the word LTT, it's better to use the word of a method, Illisport. Um, there are different test producers. We have also an ELISA for that. This is a radioactive method. I don't do that in my laboratory as an example because I don't want to work with radioactivity. I developed in the 80s um, radium monocytes, and you know, um, we don't like in Germany so much um, uh, this radioactivity in laboratories and in general. Um, in the test, we need uh, isolation of lymphocytes, so we have uh, special tubes for that. Um, and um, these uh, are these lymphocytes, you see them in the middle. Um, these lymphocytes are isolated, and then we put them into a well, and the well is coated with monoclonal uh, specific antibodies. So you can put into a well in the from gamma exam, in the lot B10, in the lot B2, which is done by the Illispot revised. It's named Illispot revised. For me, it's a experimental Illispot because in the lot B2 is not proven to document the TH2 reaction and um, it's uh, for scientific purposes, not for routine use in that case. And then you, sorry, going back, then you incubate the cells and antigens and the specific cells release cytokines or not. And then you have a positive reaction. In the next step, we are 
activation times, we add a secondary antibody complex, we add a color reaction on that, and in the end, it's an ELISA a technique, but don't uh, be irritated, it's not uh, ELISA for Borrelia antibodies, it's ELISA for the T cells, that's completely different, this color ELISA reaction. And by this, you see on the left side, at the bottom, you see these spots, and each spot means there was a lymphocyte in the blood of the patient, isolated, uh, which reacts against the antigen, in this case, Borrelia-Bopdorf antigen, we put into this well, nothing else. And you see it's a very high specific method. It depends on the antigen selection, and it's also very sensitive method. The early spot in general, or early spots, uh, these testings, uh, is 20 up to 200 fold higher sensitive than conventional antibody testing. This is a Th1 reaction, and we know that they are more sensitive than Th2 reactions for the humoral um, immune system. These are the antigens we are testing. We have a full antigen. This is from the Borrelia Bokdorfa B31 reference strain, a strain which is from Sensus Victor, so it's dominant in arthritis, for example. This is a typical American subspecies, so we check for that. Uh, we check, but also we have a lot of problems in Europe and some other countries uh, with Borrelia gariniae, and Arceliae. Gariniae is more for immunological uh, symptoms, Arceliae for skin uh, problems, but on the other hand, um, every subspecies can do every symptom. Don't say now I have Garinia, um, I, I have just uh, neurological symptoms like uh, neuropathy, for example. Uh, you see the peptide mix is a mixture of that, and we find very often the peptide mix positive in the interferon gamma release in ME patients or neurological patients, because in this mixture we have the Garinia in it, in the, uh, whereas in the uh, full antigen we don't have it um, in this antigen well. So the Borrelia Burgdorfer LF1 is the third antigen for me, very important because we know by the mimicry effect it's named, uh, or shared epitopes by Borrelia and the own body protein, uh, we find in some patients the development of autoimmune diseases like colloidinosis, rheumatoid arthritis, or vasculitis. And if LF1 is positive in Borrelia, um, it is thought we say please check the patient for antinuclear antibodies and the autoimmune disorders, keep an eye on that. And in children, it's also very important. Um, currently, the development of Elisport is now available for three subspecies, as I mentioned, in Bokdorfrei. We have it in um, Miyamoto, we have it against Bartonella Hensele. It's not so new. Um, Mycoti was developed, Chlamydia was developed, Pneumonia trachomatis, Mycoplasma, Ehrlichia, Yersinia, the viruses. Viruses react strongly on the Elisport. There's a typical TH1 reaction, Yersinia, EBV, CMV. Purpose simplex one, two, what is the source virus? Um, Candida aspergillus, and I have good news. In some months, or I hope in some weeks, we have the illness spot against Rickettsia. So I have spoken with the test producers. I need it against Rickettsia, and they do it. They want to do a broad panel so that we can check for a lot of Rickettsia subspecies. This is how you can compare the line testings um, overview. Um, in my opinion, or what I can tell you from my daily routine work with hundreds of samples, um, personally, I favorize the TICVEX Basic now. TICVEX Basic, as I mentioned, um, has uh, the first test worldwide, including ground bodies. Just we did a webinar some days ago with, uh, about TICVEX, and the TICVEX Basic has a huge advantage because of these ground bodies, and um, because we know in chronic Lyme. Uh, the patients develop intracellular cyst forms, or name it L forms, or glomorphic forms, and the biofilms. We cannot have a test against biofilms, sorry. Um, but on the other hand, we have now this worthful test, and the sensitivity is around 95%, and the sensitivity is 98%. So we can detect more antibodies against polyvoxorphry around body groups. Um, as I mentioned, has a high sensitivity, high specificity. Um, an advantage of the early spot is it reflects the last six to eight weeks of an active infection, but not longer. Why? Because lymphocytes in the peripheral blood just survive six to eight weeks, statistically. So, but I cannot uh, check or can, can t cannot tell you uh, if you suffer longer from that. Therefore, we have the CD57 cells. And the CD57 cells, this is for me a long-term parameter. It belongs to the natural killer cells. 
it's a test which uh, was massively attacked by some um, people or some maybe scientists. Um, um, we have um, good experience. We cannot say um, it's now chronic Lyme disease because chronic Lyme disease uh, means uh, by the symptoms more than one year and the symptoms can be done by a diagnosing doctor in front of the patient and is no laboratory test diagnosed again. But it correlates in a good way with a chronic Lyme disease, but we found the last years that it's also low in other bacterial infections, not virus infections, but bacterial infections, especially chlamydia and mycoplasma. The reference range uh, is now around 130. Uh, we have a borderline reference range between 100 and 130 now. So the lower, the worse, you can say. This is an example that um, in a study which was done by Professor Stricker, um, it's an older star study, but it was done with uh, neuroboliosis, and in all of these chronic Lyme patients, this group found low CD57 cells. But uh, that time they didn't check for other bacterial infections, um, uh, so they didn't check uh, chlamydia, mycoplasma, bartonella. That was not the focus of this work. So we cannot exclude by a low CD7 cells other bacterial infections. The Lyme symptom checklist, you know, there exists a lot of um, Lyme disease checklists. I want to do a warning. Please don't put all of your symptoms into Lyme disease. So uh, this is a mistake. If you say I have one of these symptoms, that doesn't mean I have Lyme disease. Because um, it's the constellation of the symptoms your doctor needs to correlate with. Um, therefore, my next challenge was after hearing a presentation from Joe Boscano in 2006 in Philadelphia. Uh, Joe Boscano is a fantastic doctor in co-infections, in his knowledge, and he teached uh, me that time um, that a lot of other symptoms uh, can be other infections. It need not to be Lyme disease symptom. As an example, uh, lack of concentration need not be a Lyme disease. And um, in literature, you can go through it and teaching books about uh, other infections like Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Babesia, Chlamydia, Yersinia, whatever. Um, you have a different constellation of symptoms, which is different in the teaching books for students and medical doctors and infectious diseases specialists. So not every pathogen, pathogen are bacteria, virus, protozoal infections, for example, or yeast and mold. Not all of these are doing um, the same symptoms in the constellation. And therefore, I developed a co-infection checklist. And here you have an example to show you that it's an electronic version now. You, uh, uh, we, we automized that. It's on the website uh, by RNM. You can download that. It's free of any cost. It costs you nothing. And uh, all of the patients I, I can see in my clinic, or not my clinic, my laboratory, um, I say, please fill out um, your symptoms, and then I know a little better about which infection is possible in your case. And this is different from patient to patient. This patient, as an example, the patient uh, crossed stomach ache, gut problems, fever, feverish feeling, position four, lack of concentration, forgetfulness, position five, painful joints, swollen joints, but the patient didn't cross all of the symptoms. Um, you can see, and this patient on the right side, it's a scoring system a program behind that. That was really a challenge for me and uh, the program a group around me. We found nine symptoms. This patient as an example, just an example, uh, which is on position one on the ranking. So this patient has additionally to some Lyme symptoms, um, chlamydia pneumonia symptoms, nine symptoms, it's ranked in position one. And also against uh, or for Coxsackie virus, it's nine symptoms, position one. And also this patient, Bartonella, eight symptoms, position two. The next, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, position three. The next, Mycoplasma, um, position uh, uh, three with seven symptoms. And also the herpes virus with EBV, CME, HSV, 1, 2, and varicella zoster virus. HHV6 belongs also to that. So now we get a ranking. And in whole medicine, it is the way the more symptoms you have for an, um, an illness, the higher is the probability that you suffer from this illness. And the prediction we're doing in medicine, our brains are programmed like that, medical doctors' brains, and the checklist is doing the same. 
So what does that mean? You can spare money by doing the checklist. And uh, in this case, I would check the patient for Lyme disease because a lot of these symptoms can be Lyme symptoms. And I would check the patient minimum for chlamydia pneumonia, Coxsackie virus, and also Echovirus, which belongs to the Coxsackie virus, to the Enterovirus group. Um, and then it's a question always of the money. In position two, I would do the Bartonella testings. And on position three, maybe, I would check for Alicia and Mycoplasma and the Herpes virus. And this you need to believe me, the correlation is really great. Where to find the checklist? Um, you can do it easily on the website um, from a and um, It's easily done, so no money, it costs you really no money. Um, now I want to talk in a second part about some testing panels because uh, some doctors and some uh, patients, they like panel testing because they are diagnosed with some symptoms. I want to talk about FM, um, RA, ME, CFS, ME in, in, in Germany, we don't use that expression, we use CFS in England and Anglo-American countries, you use ME, which is similar or the same for me. Uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, I want to talk about. I want to talk about some Europe psychiatric symptoms uh, like OCD or Tourette's. And I want to give you some idea about uh, evidence-based literature, what we know about the correlation with Lyme disease or with borrelia burgdorferi, better to say, infections and co-infections. Um, I think a lot of you know the name of Richard Horowitz. He's one of the pioneers in Lyme disease and correlating with FM symptoms, but he's not the only one. Also in 1998, um, the uh, Matman, uh, around Matman, Leider Matman, they said most FM patients are Lyme positive. So um, Richard Horowitz uh, is a pioneer, but he's not the only one talking about that. And maybe you have heard that we want to do a study in, uh, with a, a British group, with a professor. Um, one is Professor Puri, for example. We want to do a study together. A little money is missing still for the patients. And uh, maybe if you have some idea how to support this, it would be wonderful to start a study with FM patients versus healthy patients, because we think that there can be really a correlation with it, but what we need uh, would be scientific studies. And now we're doing it, or we plan to do that. Um, there are numerous scientific references um, about that. This is not the only study I can show you, but we don't have the time to go all of that. Um, what I want to point out that FM symptoms um, need not to be an infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, we have also some evidence that chlamydia can do that. Chlamydia pneumonia, don't be so worried about Trophomatis, but we know that Trophomatis also can do FM. And in the study which I have mentioned, we plan we also will check for chlamydia infections. We, we think that maybe one of these pathogens uh, can be associated with FM, but what I want to point out, I never uh, have seen one uh, patient with just one infection. All of the patients I can see in laboratory test results have multiple infections. So patients can have chlamydia infections plus borrelia infections, same time active in the body. Um, also, mycoplasma can be a challenge in FM and also chronic fatigue or ME and arthritis patients. So mycoplasma, you heard about the name uh, Garth Nicholson. Garth Nicholson, I think he's a great professor from America. He's a pioneer of mycoplasma and uh, he found out the Gulf War I syndrome um, in the 90s. Um, and he, he knows a lot about mycoplasma and I think he's correct in this point of view. Also, don't forget the viruses. Uh, as I mentioned before, for me, viruses play a very important role in, uh, in chronic infections. Um, I don't know if it's um, reactivated or maybe it's originally the reason or after a while EBV or CMV can do fibromyalgia in this case. So this is very important, not just to be focused too much on Lyme disease. And why is it so important? If you are to focus on Lyme disease and um, maybe you have antibodies and use antibiotics and you have a virus infection additionally, I swear this is not the absolutely best way for you. And if you don't improve after a short while, 
um, please think about virus infection or think about other infections, not to be virus infection, but CMV, EBV is one of the dominant virus infections in the world. RA infections, um, we have in 2007 a study about serum reactivity against Borrelia-Burgdorferi OSPA. The OSPA, as I mentioned before, is LFA1 in the response. So this is the mimicry effect. It was described in 2007. So we need to check patients with RA. We need with the syndrome of this unexplained illness, we need to check them uh, for the LFI1 in routine. Rheumatologists uh, need to do that, but what I know, they don't do that. Um, results in this study about mycoplasma with the RA infection. Again, Garth Nicholson, the pioneer, it was done also some years ago. You can see that also patients with RA have my or had mycoplasma infections. The question is always, is mycoplasma really active in these patients or is it triggering? Um, on the other hand, I can tell you what I can see by IgA testings for mycoplasma and the ELIS spot that we find um, some of the RA patients with active mycoplasma infections. So you can suffer from RA, but you can suffer additionally from mycoplasma infections, which also do some symptoms in your body. Um, so it doesn't matter. Uh, also, it can mean that uh, RA patients need antibiotics, but maybe also need treatment for RA. But um, if you don't check for mycoplasma, then you miss information and uh, you don't get the chance to recover um, more with, uh, um, by the mycoplasma infection. This is a huge panel now, uh, FM and RA. These are all the possible lab tests. Um, okay, from a laboratory test side, um, these uh, pathogens can all do that. But on the other hand, it's always a question of money. Um, if you do the confection checklist and the line short checklist, uh, you can maybe spare some money from that, but you will find some of these uh, pathogens in your case also if you suffer from FM and RA by the co-infection checklist. ME and Lyme borreliosis. Um, it's two decades ago that in ME and Lyme um, the first association was done. So two decades ago what happened meanwhile, uh, let me say nearly nothing. Um, the ME international consensus uh, paper, it's considering still Lyme disease and Borrelia-Bogdorferi, but you find also mycoplasma, you find also enteroviruses, you find EBV, CMV, HHV6, you find chlamydia pneumonia in this. So uh, parvovirus also to mention. So you find uh, some of these already in the international consensus paper, um, but my experience is that the experts from ME are not checking for all of these pathogens and uh, when they check, they don't check with the correct test or the right test or the best test. Uh, if you have an IgA testing, you need an IgA testing, not an IgM testing. IgM is not the marker for chronic infections. Uh, it's a systemic marker. If you have um, the possibility for LA spots um, for mycoplasma, Borrelia, you should do that. Uh, but in some countries, these tests simply don't exist. These are all references for the association, Lyme disease and the ME. And again, another one. Um, for me, again, coming back, um, I, I don't want to be so branded in the field of Lyme disease. I think we also need to check in uh, neurological um, symptoms. We need to check the herpes virus. It's so important to me and more and more messages coming out now that EBV, herpes simplex, virus 1-2, cytomegalovirus, varicella cystovirus, virus, HHV6 are doing neurological symptoms. And in, in this field, uh, we name them neurotropic viruses, neurotropic virus. On the other hand, they can also irritate your heart rhythm. EBV, herpes simplex, CMV, they can irritate your heart rhythm. So they also can do colitis, for example. Um, they can do uh, the ME with you. HHV6 can do the ME with you. And the next question, can we have maybe a uh, uh, should we have some multiple infections with these viruses? And I can say, yes, by my laboratory findings, I find some patients with multiple virus infections. The Coxsackie, this is one of my favorites. Um, 
not that I like that, but um, the B1 uh, is very famous to say that in ME patients. A new paper came out last year, a new study with Coxsackie virus and echo virus, and they found a correlation with ALS and dementia. Very interesting paper. And they used, um, what is it name? its name, the virostatics, virostatics virus therapies, and some of these patients improve from this dementia and ALS. That doesn't mean that ALS cannot be another infection or another reason, but it belongs to the differentials a doctor has to think about. But um, it's not so well known in the world, uh, this paper. ME, often called CFS, um, um, this uh, is a panel. You can do that panel testing. Uh, if you want to do, then you don't miss one of these pathogens. This is maybe an advantage to panel testings. But also, um, if you want to spare money, again, coming back, you can uh, do the align and the confection checklist to find out in your individual case which pathogen can be active clinically in your case or not. In the uh, 2016, there was another study of Alzheimer's disease. 31 authors, they found out herpes simplex virus type 1, chlamydia pneumonia, and some other types of spirochetes um, responsible or maybe uh, triggering Alzheimer's disease. It's a very important study about that. Um, so more and more work is done on these viruses, and I think it's really important to do that. On the other hand, these groups are not checking for Lyme disease. They are not checking for Bartonella. So what we need is an interdisciplinary group um, checking also um, the uh, additional infections with bacteria because it's so important for therapy decisions if you have multiple infections with bacteria plus viruses. It doesn't make really sense to treat a virus with uh, antibiotics. It doesn't make really sense to treat a bacteria with virostatics. Um, so we are more and more on the way to check for uh, chronic multiple infections with bacteria, viruses, parasites, yeast, and mold. Um, you know maybe uh, the name Alan McDonald and confirmed now by another doctor previously now. Um, they said it was a hypothesis, now more proven, that the Alzheimer's plaques can be biofilms from a spirochete from Bolebogdorfri, but also chlamydia pneumonia is doing biofilms and mycoplasma too. Um, the question is now, um, can be such a plug, can it be um, a biofilm? Because this is really important for your therapy. Again, uh, if you don't um, destroy the biofilm, the antibiotic cannot reach uh, but Borrelia or cannot reach chlamydia. It's protection um, um, area, it's protection zone. It's, it's really important to know about the biofilms. We don't have a testings, as I mentioned, but we can test against round bodies, and we know that round bodies also doing biofilms. This is a panel if you want to do panel testing for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, there's a vast, uh, a big number of microbes. They are associated with psychiatric symptoms. We cannot go through all of that. If you have some specific questions, you can email me or my lab team or AM. We can do nearly all of these testings. We can do nearly all of them. Uh, not all can be done by um, antibodies or by alias spots. Uh, but some can be done by that, by ELISA, for example, Streptococcus, we can check the SL titer or the anti streptococcus DNA titer or the hyaluronidase titer for Staphylococcus, we can check for fermentans, we have now the TICPLEX uh, plus, it's included in this. Tuberculosis, I cannot do, I have a S3, S2 laboratory, but I can do it in a, a laboratory with S3, the Aquaniperona Elispot test also. In a different laboratory nearby, I can offer that too. Um, microbes, again, also the viruses, don't underestimate the viruses. Uh, HHV7, HHV8, we have, I found also some positive HHV7, HHV8 patients, it's um, a minor problem. The dominant virus in this complexity, HHV6, HHV7, HHV8 is HHV6, and you can do a good IgG, IgM testing and a PCR for it. Uh, sorry, going back. The parasites, we have now developed a parasital panel because um, 
I'm sure that we miss also parasitical infections in some of the patients, not all of them, in the complexity of conical um, um, multiple, multiple infections. And also we check for fungi, for aspergillus and candida now. Um, in this paper, it's described that uh, there's a greater frequency of Lyme disease symptoms uh, with a greater number of OCD and also Toxoplasma gondii. It's a, it's a pathogen which has to do with the cat and uh, it's dangerous for pregnant women, but it's also if you have cat contact or if you eat raw meat, you have a higher risk for toxoplasmosis. And in America, there is now a tendency to check a lot of patients with also um, OCI um, with this uh, uh, obsessive compulsive inventory. You check them the disorder, so you check the disorder um, by this um, toxophobic toxoplasma gondii. Oh, but I need to say we don't have an illispot, we don't have an IgA test, we have just an IgM test, so it's difficult um, to find out actually. My mycoplasma can be also associated with OCD and Tourette's. Uh, this could be a panel. You find the uh, anti-DNA speed titer and the anti stabilizing titer. We do lots of them. That's a routine test. It's uh, accredited. It's recertified. No problem to build that. Always do the IgA antibodies if you have the chance and do ilispots. For toxoplasma, we are missing the IgA. I'm working on that. I hope that the tendency in chronic infections will go more uh, in, the, in the direction of IgA testing. So does that mean multiple um, symptoms, multiple infections? Yes, I can clearly answer with yes. In all of the reports, I'm validating all reports and what I can say, uh, every patient I validate has multiple infections. But it's different from patient to patient. Single line, a single infection for a level of drop right back to see from laboratory test site doesn't exist. All of the patients have multiple or signs for multiple in uh, infections. For further information on testing, there uh, is a lot of uh, presentations by ANM. ANM, I think it's, it's wonderful that they are working on these projects. I think it's really a challenge, not just in England. Also, we would uh, like to clone ANM in other countries. We would be happy in, in other countries to check and to inform more about multiple infections. And if you're interesting, uh, I did some pres presentations about that. You can download that. And um, this is also, you see some very interesting names in the field, Judy Mikovic or, for example, Professor Puri. These are some of the pioneers that are working, we work together. And all presentations you can find also of the annual conferences. You can download them. It's uh, everything is possible nowadays in our time. And everyone uh, has a YouTube channel. And uh, Jimmy Crowder, who is the moderator uh, tonight, she does all, always some uh, Skype trainings for my testings because um, I know that with one of these webinars it's not done. You always need to, uh, to say which, uh, to explain results to patients and sometimes to therapists. And thank you very much for your attention. And now I change back to um, the moderator. Thank you very much, Armin. That was uh, tremendous. Obviously, it's just an overview in the short time that we have, and we will be having further webinars with you going into specific subjects. For example, the neuropsychiatric area, we can cover in greater detail the viruses um, specifically. Um, there were several questions um, in the course of your talk, which I've noted down. And if there are further questions, please click on chat below not q and a though we will pick up questions from there too but chat is the easiest button and if you after typing in your question click on return then it will be visible to the host and um, will attempt to answer them all and those that we can't answer today um, dr schwarzbach will answer afterwards and we'll put them onto our website so the first question that i saw was um, about round bodies i mean if you could just explain a little bit more what they actually are. That wasn't quite clear to some of the listeners. Yeah, I was involved in, the, it's, it was named the High License One uh, work with the European Union. European Union gave, I think that time, one over one million euro for scientific groups. And uh, we found in this scientific work, it was the development of a biochip system that time. It started in 2000, 2010 around that in Brussels. 
and a Finnish group around Professor Gilbert uh, in Jöpskler. Um, we discussed that, uh, we were nearby Finnish sauna that evening and we discussed and we said, why not to check for round bodies? Well, what is a round body? A round body is um, a pleomorph. So we know if you maybe try to attack really with antibiotics, uh, or you make a bad environment where you are protecting by a biofilm and a round body. A round body means it's really like looking at a round body with a double membrane. It's not li like a spider fit. And um, our body in chronic Lyme produces antibodies, IgG or IgM, whatever, against these round bodies. Uh, the better scientific word is now pleomorphic form, we have, uh, I was involved in two scientific uh, PubMed papers about that with Professor Gilbert. And this is very interesting um, to, to check this round body antibodies. Because this means the uh, Borrelia is an is a, is a older one. It's not, a, it's, not the, uh, it's not the Bulzaresh where we find the whole spider of it. Um, these round body antibodies seem to be, play a very important role in chronic persistence. Or name it persistence. Maybe persistence is a better word for that. Well, one question to follow on from that uh, that's just come up is whether it's an idea to check for round bodies from time to time, like every few years, just to make sure that in attacking Lyme, if you have had it yeah. with antibodies or antimicrobials, that um, it hasn't just sort of retreated into this uh, hidden form exactly. and become undetectable. Exactly. Uh, there are two points. If you uh, don't find antibodies by West Central, Western blood is not checking for round body mm. So you, you miss the information, you miss maybe 30% of sensitivity or 35%. Then do the round bodies and then you find them. What does that mean? You need an intracellular therapy, you need a therapy maybe with a, a tinidosol, metronidosol to come into the cells because these round bodies are also intracellular. And you know this is a protection mechanism. And also in the follow up, you're absolutely correct. Um, you, maybe you check this, um, but don't test yourself if you're healthy. <laughs> that doesn't make really sense. Um, you don't give antibodies prophylactic. Maybe if you have round body IgG antibodies, IgG means uh, maybe a natural protection against this. Um, antibiotics can be immune suppressed with, against the T cells, so then you can develop a mechanistic infection with virus or yeast or mold or whatever. So be careful in this. Um, but if you have still persistent symptoms, check for our body antibodies. And if you find persistence, um, the question is what to do. And you know, uh, Richard Holland is, is working on harder drugs like Dapsone, Dapsomycin from that time. So, um, but what about biofilms? So I think all the biofilms. You, you've just mentioned biofilms. and We've had two questions. I know we're not really talking about therapy today. We will, I'm sure, have further webinars about therapy specifically, but um, have you got any quick tips on how to break biofilm? Because several people have asked. I, I, I'm not the expert in this, but I, I know Eva Sapi and I admire her work. And uh, she did a lot of work on that. And what I know spontaneously, there are three main biofilm breakers from my uh, time when I heard presentation at ILAS conferences by Sapi. It was um, natokinase, lumprokinase, and serapinase. These are and the main. Here, I believe, things. as well. Stevia yeah. she seemed to be very effective. Didn't Stevia, she? okay, you know a little more, you're more therapist. Um, also, uh, we in Germany, it's a slime, you know, and maybe you can use ACC, acetylcysteine, to solve the slime. But if you don't drink enough, you cannot break the biofins. You cannot uh, mm. bring them into solution. You know, it's simply a slime coming out. Yeah. Thank you for telling us about the CD57 and how that indicates immunosuppression if it's low earlier. Um, one question is whether low CD57 results might actually indicate that the central nervous system has been infected. Is there evidence of that? Yeah, there's one study about autism, very impressive study by Kenny Emery, he's a colleague professor in Brussels, and he showed in this physiological condition that 70% of autistic children, they all had low CD57 cells. So there seem, seems to be, and the, and the first study was done with virus sticker, it seems that the natural killer cell function is blocked in uh, neuroboliosis, uh, neurological, neuropsychiatric symptoms. Thank you. And another question is whether a low count is um, limited to bacterial infections. Um, the, the one 
listener is saying that she's found conflicting answers about that. The, sorry, the law? What was yeah, the, it, the law? A low CD57, it can always be associated with bacterial rather than viral infections. Uh, viruses doing higher if you uh, go through literature, but the viruses are doing also low CD56 cells. You know, this is a typical HRE marker. Um, and for me, more important than elevated CD57, I don't find so many, but uh, what about the discussion? You have a bacteria plus a virus, what about CD57 cells? Maybe they are normal because virus is bringing high, bacteria low, we need studies for that for sure, but uh, viruses doing low CD3 cells. Okay. Not every time, sorry, in very bad conditions. Thank you. And um, another question here, how um, effective are the antigens used here in Europe and in your lab for patients who may have picked up their infections in, for example, America or in other, on other mm -hmm. continents? Yeah, for Lyme disease, um, I think we have the main three subspecies, uh, as I mentioned. Um, in, in Europe, we have some Lusitania, Spilmani subspecies. We don't have testings for that, so that's problematic. Um, in America, and the stricter is the dominant. For all other um, co-infections, um, that might be also problematic because um, the antigen antigens are over 90% specific in every case uh, the test producers are using for every test, but um, it's not so high specific for them. You can also cross that. So um, Bartonella, for example, if you do an IFA, immune fluorescence uh, assay, this is really an unspecific cross-reactive test. It's ELISA is more specific again. Um, the rest of the blood brings more higher than the specificity. Again, but resin blocks are ex expensive. Um, I think uh, we need more antigens um, to find out more about these subspecies. And the, um, in the veterinarians, interestingly, in Germany, they have a lot of testings um, for different Rickettsia subspecies. It's not just one Rickettsia, but this is a very good question. But what I can tell you that we, in, in Lyme disease, I think we fi find most patients, um, 85%. And that can be, all, uh, again, the reason why we don't uh, find out one of Thank you. Yeah. A, a therapist is asking whether if you find um, that your patient is negative for the Ellie spot and for the Sarah spot, but positive for co-infections, whether mm. um, you can um, assume that the Lyme test is a correct negative or whether you should perhaps go on and mm. um, use the tick -tick basic. Yeah. <laughs> very good question. Therapists have very good questions. Um, yeah, um, my exp no experience, we know that uh, in chronic infections, there can be Th1 and Th2 problems. So we name it uh, T, uh, T cellular immune deficiencies and B cellular immune deficiencies. So for me also, if you have that suspicion, you should check this patient for the immune globulins, do a quantification, IgG, IgH, IgM, if they produce enough um, antibodies. And for the T cells, you can get an information by the CD3 cells and the CD19 um, cells. So we have possibilities to check the, these immune levels. It's not in the standard laboratory done, but if you have a suspicion that the immune system cannot react because it's suppressed, and we know also that uh, Borrelia is inhibiting the complement, C3A, C4, I still get it to work on that too. Um, so um, an antibody is not working, uh, is, oh, sorry, anti an antibody is just working with complement activation, but some Borrelia subspecies block the complement uh, system, so the antibody cannot work, the antibody is not used, so the antibody is maybe, we would say, false negative or blocked. We have also IgG subclass deficiencies you can do if IgG is low, and this is a very complex question, but the tick class, I think, is the most sensitive uh, testing we have now. For, for, for um, serology? For serology, yeah. for antibodies. Tick class is a, is a TH2 system, a uh, humor antibody test. Yeah, but if, if you um, have to choose between antibodies and LE spots where an LE spot is available, uh, would you say that it's always uh, worth 
giving preference to the LA spot? That's likely to be. Um, if it's a question of money, as I mentioned before, it's 20 up to 200 fold more sensitive. If I would have an IgA testing for Borrelia, I would do an IgA testing, but we don't have that. Uh, no CDC is working on that, uh, but we need an IgA because this represents the local inflammation process. Um, it's not the IgM. IgM is, as I mentioned, a systemic marker. I don't like the IgM personally. In chronic um, illnesses, it's more the IgA. So for Yersinia, you find um, also IgA uh, and positive illy spots, but you can also find just illy spot positive, no IgA. You can find also just IgA, no illy spot. It depends patient to patient. We, we say both TH1, TH2 and natural kills, uh, killer cell system, they complement each other in every natural immune reaction. Right. But I, I think in general, one can say that because IgG is past infection and will generally be dismissed by sort of allopathic doctors, conventional doctors as okay, well, you've had it in the past, but you don't have it now. And IgM is generally only present for about four weeks and then disappears. It changes, doesn't it, into an IgG? I, I favorized the illispot or the T cell immunity uh, because in tuberculosis, we have the same problem. You know, in tuberculosis, antibodies are negative. We don't do that any longer. We do the Elis Water Coniferon test. Yeah, yeah. So I think that answers one of the other questions that's come up here. And then um, there is a question about how one can um, uh, understand the IgA in relation to IgM. Is IgA more likely to reflect chronic but ongoing illness? IgA is, um, is the only immune globulin which is. Um, produced um, in localized infections. And we know that all of these infections are localized infections. Okay. They are not systemic infections in most patients. In, the, in stage one, two, you get a summer flu, maybe in stage one, then it's systemic for sure. Um, systemic means that it's massively in the bloodstream. Um, this is not the case in Borrelia with Recurrentis, which is also Borrelia subspecies, uh, not with Dorfri, uh, can also, you find IgM in systemic or reactivations or whatever. But uh, the IgA is the only immune globulin we can document as a localized inflammation or infection marker. Right, thank you. Now, quite a few questions have come in relating to therapy. Um, for example, whether you also provide outline guidance on herbs, vitamins, and antibiotics. I think there it would be fair to say that you specialize in the testing and not so much uh, really in the therapy. It's important, isn't it, to have a therapy? Yeah, uh, testing. it's not absolutely correct. I work two years in infectious disease. And no, I mean, I mean as, as the laboratory surgeon. Um, yeah, yeah, but I know the background. I can advise doctors. So uh, in laboratory, we, laboratory doctors are allowed to advise doctors in antibiotics you know, mm -hmm. or rather statics. I know a lot about, about this. Um, this is a normal job education of German laboratory doctors being medical doctors. Um, also, herbs, this is not my specialty for sure. I know naturopaths, so I think we need uh, somebody supporting in this. Um, um, but I'm not the absolutely expert in this. I, I come around the world and I hear here what you can use there. You, you mentioned stevia, I heard the same. Um, so, but I'm not expert. Uh, well, since you have mentioned therapy, another question has come in asking whether hypothermia is effective at breaking down biofilms and treating Borrelia intracellularly. Do you have um, yeah. anything to say um, about that before we finish? Yeah, there was one study, in vitro study, that showed that if you increase temperature very high and use antibiotics at the peak of the high temperature, you can destroy Borrelia in vitro. Um, this is a very hard therapy because you need anesthesia for the patients, um, very expensive therapy. Uh, we have um, on the other side, the moderate, it's, this is named more the uh, heart, heart uh, hypothermia, the high, 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 high temperature. We have the moderate temperature hypothermia, which is riskless, which a lot of therapists are using more. And it's not so riskful. The question is if you have additional virus infection, cannot do the hyperthermia plus antibiotics, I would favorize the moderate form. I understand. Okay, thank you. Well, um, we'll go through the other questions that have come in and um, see whether there are others that haven't been answered. Some of them have been um, duplicated. I can see that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe one last one. Do you suspect that heat therapy given prior to testing for Lyme may increase the rate of detection? Or, or um, any other kind of yeah. provocation, as it were? Yeah, I, I think yes.
course, if you have a Herxheimer reaction or Herxheimer like reaction, it's better to name that. Uh, how does that happen? How Herxheimer is, is if you do therapy, which can be successful afterwards, uh, the patient uh, got worse uh, second week or third week um, or first week by more symptoms because you destroy a bacteria uh, like Borrelia and then um, there's a higher, pro um, uh, this, all of these toxins or whatever you name it or the protein structures, when you destroy a pathogen, is coming to your bloodstream and you react uh, and you maybe reactivate it. So interesting would be the question if you do maybe um, Elisport or antibodies during a Herxheimer reaction. Okay. Very interesting question. And I think we have better chances to find um, the pathogens um, if we provoke some provocation. There was one study by Professor Perron. He did a PCR in blood and he did provocation with some herbal remedies, I think, and he found more or high, more positive Borrelia PCR in the blood stream or rest of Borrelia by these herbal therapies. Maybe this can be a challenge for the future uh, to do uh, more studies on that. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. That was fascinating and um, already looking forward to having the next webinar with you. I just want to mention that in the um, sessions that I do on Tuesday evenings, every second Tuesday, we do pull in arm in for any um, questions that I can't answer. So there's always the opportunity to get uh, more specialist information from him. Uh, just to mention that we will be having another webinar on the 26th of March where we'll have the CEO of Molecularo Labs in Oklahoma talking about the Cunningham panel, which is a test for neuropsychiatric conditions such as PANS, PANDAS, but also adult um, autoimmune encephalitis. And um, he'll be talking about uh, the knowledge that one can gain from that and how to decide whether to use it as a test or not. And also a little bit about what to do following the results. So that's going to be very interesting too. So, Armin, thank you very much indeed, and look forward to talking again soon. Thank you very much for hosting that um, webinar, and I know that we could not answer all of the questions. If you have some questions, you can email yes. to A&M, yep. yes. um, and we try to give our best, do our best. Um, um, Lyme disease is maybe, a worry about why the known unknown, and we need the from all of you and uh, we are in one community and we minority in this field and I hope that we will get some breakthrough the next years uh, for all sufferers. Thank you very much and I wish you a pleasant day or a pleasant evening or a pleasant night from Germany. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.